bhavatu saha no bhunaktu saha viryam karavavahai tejasvi na vaditamastu ma vidvishavahai om shanti 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 Om, may the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Again, Sorry. We'll... I was late. Oh, not at all, dear. Um, Lost my email. I welcome, had to hunt welcome, for it. Welcome to our gathering on Tuesday night to read and discuss the life of Sri Sharda Devi, the Holy Mother. Uh, the book is Sri Sharda Devi, Her Divine Play, um, compiled and uh, commented on by Swami Chetanamda, the head minister in uh, St. Louis, St. Louis Vedanta Society. So thank you, uh, Haima, for coming to serve as our reader. Thank you for the rest of you for, for okay. gracing this gathering. And if I'm not mistaken, we're on yeah. uh, the subhead love and compassion. Yes. You want me to go ahead and start, Brother Shankar? I think it's a good idea. What is this? Somebody just wrote something in the chat. Oh, I just sent them the page number 647. Okay, very good. It's love and compassion. Okay, please go on. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Namaste. Without love and compassion, human beings are like beasts. These two noble qualities make life smooth and joyful. They exist in every human heart to, to differing degrees. That person is great whose love and compassion are focused on others. Through love and compassion, one can get rid of selfishness, which is a sin. Jesus taught his disciples to love their neighbors and to treat others like the good Samaritan who rescued a wounded man by the side of the road. Let's just pause there. Sure. Love and compassion, these noble qualities, these are extolled by Sri Krishna in the Gita. He says those who exhibit those qualities, those who suffer with the sufferings of others and are able to exult with the joys of others, he says, are very dear to him. And then, as it points out, uh, Jesus taught his people is, uh, well, first, let's go back to selfishness. Selfishness being a sin. What is sin? Sin is missing the mark. That's all that that means. It's not that sin is this great burden. Of course, it has karmic consequences. If you're selfish, the world, the universe itself will seem selfish to you. But love and compassion, cultivating love and compassion can help one get rid of this self-centered idea. Jesus taught his disciples to love their neighbors and treat others like the good Samaritan who rescued a wounded man by the side of the road. Not only did he rescue this the Samaritan, but the Samaritan rescued someone who ordinarily would be 
reviled by Samaritans because those people persecuted the Samaritans. And so instead of just as many others had done, passing by this suffering man, this wounded man, the Samaritan overcame prejudice and the persecution that the Samaritans suffered at the hands of these others. So then he stopped and he rescued this man. And Jesus used this as a parable. So please go ahead now. Sure. Buddha, Ramakrishna and other great teachers taught their followers to love and serve people with their hearts and souls. Holy Mother was the embodiment of love and compassion. And these qualities were manifested in all her actions and dealings with people. Although Holy Mother followed the social customs of her time, she did not approve of all of them. For example, Orthodox Hindu widows of Bengal led a very austere life during Holy Mother's lifetime. They ate one strict vegetarian meal a day, fasted on the Ekadasi day, shaved their heads, did not put oil on their bodies, wore a plain white sari, practiced spiritual disciplines, and so on. Holy Mother herself did not follow such strict rules. As a matter of fact, she was told by Sri Ramakrishna not to follow such strict rules because she wasn't a widow. He said, you're not a widow. I'm just in the next room. I'm just behind the curtain. And so he told her not to behave as a widow, not to shave her head, not to uh, uh, wear this borderless sari and so on. She was about to tear the border off her sari. And that's when the master appeared to her and intervened and said, what are you doing? You're behaving like a widow. You're not a widow. So Holy Mother herself did not follow such strict rules. Indeed, she did not by the master's advice. Okay, dear. After the master's passing away, she ate vegetarian, vegetarian food and wore a plain white sari with a thin red border and did not shave her head. Due to social pressure, some window, widows practiced such rigorous austerities that it seemed they would kill themselves. The mother advised one such widow. At night, first offered chapatis, milk, fruits, and sweets to the master, and then eat them. According to the custom of those times, a widow was not supposed to eat cooked rice twice a day. The mother modified the rule for the sake of that widow's fragile health. Shirod Bala Roy, a young widow from Bangladesh, came to Udbodhan House for initiation. She was a very austere woman and observed the local customs to excess. She recalled, starting at me intently, the mother asked, my child, what do you take on Ekadashi day? I replied, formerly I used to eat sago, but learning to, learning that it is adulterated with various other things, I don't take it now. As soon as she heard this, the mother said, no, no, I say you should take sago. It will keep your body cool. Then with the deep sorrow in her voice, the mother said, child, you've been practicing much austerity. I say, don't do it any further. 
your body has almost turned into a piece of wood. How will you perform spiritual practices if your health is broken, my child? She asked whether I used oil. I said, I haven't used it ever since I was widowed. On hearing this, the mother said, the use of oil keeps the head cool, therefore use oil. I said, as I have not used it for a long time, I have begun to hate the feel of it. I shall not be able to use oil, mother. Golapma said, though she's very young, she has ruined her health by fasting and practicing other austerities. Gaurima said, dear, why have you cut off your hair? I said, widows in our part of the country do not grow their hair. Gaurima replied, without hair, one's eyesight deteriorates. Since you have dedicated your body to Sri Krishna, how does your hair belong to you, dear? <laughs> what a wonderful turn of thought. Wonderful. Since you dedicated your body to Sri Krishna, obviously that was the young widow, was the young woman's yeah. uh, chosen ideal. Well, now that you've dedicated your body to Sri Krishna, how does your hair belong to you, dear? <laughs> what a wonderful turn of thought. Anyone have any comments or questions about these things that have been said, and most particularly about this uh, this business? I think there's no medical proof that cutting off your hair or shaving your head uh, leads to eyesight. loss of eyesight. Um, otherwise, many monks and nuns, uh, particularly of the Buddhist orders, would be uh, half blind or worse. Uh, any, but anything else anyone would like to ask or, or comment on? This type of practice, this type of practice continued during my grandmother's generation, Brother Shankara. Slowly things changed as my mother's generation came. Slowly, slowly, some things changed. Half of yes. those were dropped out. Yes, the the uh, the the. Uh, the the idea that widows couldn't be married again also was uh, was in some sectors dropped. Yeah. I don't know if that remained so in the villages, yeah. but uh, yeah. villages continued pretty much. Yes. So, anything else from anyone? Anyone from anything from your own experience or wisdom? Yes, or, widow's life was very hard in the, in those times. Yes. No question, Sham. And, and and just exactly why? Well, it was for the spiritual benefit of their husband, their dead husband. That's why they did all these things. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, the this this was a kind of mythology that uh, didn't bear close scrutiny. It was superstition, as Vivekananda called it. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. So some of the swamis, now I see like sometimes they have hair and then sometimes they cut it. Is that just for convenience or um, anything else? Well, when you're, when you're a brahmachari, you're supposed to keep your hair cut quite short. Um, when you become a swami, you are not to be bearded. Um, these rules are relaxed over the years, uh, and uh, they completely this business about you know hair and beard and all that they completely disappear after age seventy or seventy two. I've forgotten, but um, you know I think uh, most swamis uh, just to, and and for that matter many of the nuns as well. They just keep their hair short because then they don't have to fool with it. They don't have to style it or, or, or do anything other than just towel it off in the morning. Um, and if I could see better, 
uh, I would keep mine the length that it is now because that's uh, what it is, what what happens. Um, but uh, since I can't operate the equipment anymore to, to keep it short, uh, I have to depend on Jyoti to do it, and she does it uh, as is as is as she's able to. So that's that's about all the answer I can really give you, dear. Thank you. I think convenience is the operative word, yeah. Anything else from anyone? Okay, please go on, dear. Sure. Gaurima replied, without hair, one's eyesight deteriorates. Since you have dedicated your body to Sri Krishna, how does your hair belong to you, dear? Yogin Madan said, the body is the temple of God. It is wise to keep it fit. But the mother said, you have done well. Keeping one's hair gives rise to a feeling of fashionableness to some extent, for one has to take care of it. So what you have done is right. You have overcome the craze for luxuriant locks and you have also come here. You have now achieved that for which you lived so austerely. Now I say, don't indulge in such austerities any longer. You will have initiation tomorrow. Come here at eight o'clock in the morning. It will be nice to take a holy dip in the Ganges and to see Mother Kali on the day of initiation. So she instructed her to, to bathe in the Ganges and to go to the Kaligat temple before, or the Dakshineshwar temple, one or the other, uh, before uh, initiation. It, she probably meant Kaligat because that was much closer than Dakshineshwar to Udbogan. Okay, dear. Once when the master was still alive, Yoginma took her widowed aunt to Dakshineshwar. It was an Ekadashi day and she was fasting, taking neither food nor water. She had fasted the previous day also. When this elderly woman arrived at the Nahaba, she was gasping and could not stand erect. The mother held her and asked, shall I give you a little sherbet? The woman refused because she was fasting. After a while, the mother and Yoginma took her to the master's room. While going up the steps, she almost fell. Immediately, the master came forward and held out his hand to her. The, mother, the master asked, why is she gasping? Yoginma explained the situation. Then the master said to Holy Mother, why did you not give her a little sherbet? The mother replied that she had offered it, but the widow refused to take it. The master then took some sugar from his shelf, mixed it with some Ganges water and said to the woman, please drink. She looked at the master's face and then drank without another word. <laughs> She said gratefully, Father, my heart is cool now. Ramakrishna and Holy Mother never encouraged the mortification of the flesh. As a matter of fact, Sri Ramakrishna on one occasion that's reported in the gospel, these um, women who were worshippers of Shiva saw Shiva in him and came to see him. And uh, they, they were in the habit of fasting. Uh, and uh, they would sometimes fast, I guess, always fasted when they came to see him. And he just told them, stop it, stop it, stop it. I can't stand to see a woman fast. I can't stand to see her suffer. And so uh, this was the same attitude manifested by the mother. You know, they did not encourage mortification of the body, of the flesh. 
And of course, Krishna uh, is very explicit about that in the Gita also. He says, walk the middle path. Not too much fasting, not too much indulgence in food, not too much sleep, not too little, not too much exercise, not too little, you know, all these things. Walk the middle way. And of course, the Buddha also was very explicit about that. Any comments or questions from anyone? All right, dear, go ahead. One cannot concentrate on God if one suffers from hunger pangs. The master said, religion is not possible on an empty stomach. And, and, well, and let's just talk about the medical science of this. If your blood sugar is low, you simply are, feel weary and cannot concentrate. So it's, it's just a medical fact that if your blood sugar gets too low, as that woman's had that came to the master and almost fell on the steps to his room, and what did he give her? He gave her a little sugar mixed with Ganges water to get her blood sugar. So, uh, Swayam, isn't that so? What are the effects of, of low blood sugar from the from the perspective of an MD? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, low sugar um, causes jitteriness, um, just weakness, fatigue, um, and in really. Um, Severe a low blood sugar, one can just faint completely. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's actually less um, less desired than a higher blood sugar. So mm -hmm. that's why in older people with even with diabetes, their um, level that is kept um, is a little bit higher than for the younger because it, the risk of low sugar is much higher than. Let's go for a little bit higher sugar. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Now that comes from an MD, a very highly trained pediatrician who knows these things. So be careful of your blood sugar. Jitteriness, of course, is a way of saying nervousness and nervousness prevents concentration. It's just as, it's just as simple as that. So, Thank you, dear. All right, please go ahead, dear. One cannot concentrate on God if one suffers from hunger pangs. The master said, religion is not possible on an empty stomach. Holy Mother also said, first calm your body with food and drink, and then call on God. This is a very practical teaching. Holy Mother's sister-in-law, Surabala, was very sad after her husband's death and decided to eat only boiled rice and ghee once a day and strictly observe the Ekadashi fast without even drinking water. The mother told her, don't torture yourself. Please drink water. Look, if the soul wants to eat something, one should offer it. Otherwise, fasting becomes a harmful act. The soul cries out saying, she has deprived me of food. Holy Mother, Yogin Ma and Golap Ma did not fast completely on the Ekadashi day. They ate luchis, fruit and sweets. Uh, let's, let's just stop and think about that. Sure. This is sensible. You know, the mother is saying, be sensible. Be, you know, for, here's, here's a little story about Swami Yogatmananda. Swami Yogatmananda is very fond of tea. He's very fond of tea with hot chilies in it. And he said, Sometimes when he sits for meditation, the body says, I want some tea, I want some tea, I want some tea. 
in other words, a little uplift of uh, you know both the chilies and the uh, caffeine and the tea uh, get the blood moving a little bit. And he said, I used to resist. But he says, now when that desire arises, I just get up and have some tea. And then I go back to the cushion. And he was giving this as an instruction to his congregation, his disciples. Don't be rigid with yourself. You, know, you have nothing to prove. You have nothing, not one thing to prove to anyone. You are a child of the divine. And, and so read these practical instructions again, dear, from Yes. Where, where it says that the three of them did not uh, fast on yes, a condition. I stop there. Holy Mother Sister in La Surabala was very sad after her husband's death and decided to eat only boiled rice and ghee once a day and strictly observe the Ekadashi fast without even drinking water. The mother told her, Don't torture yourself. Please drink water. Look, if the soul wants to eat something, one should offer it. Otherwise, fasting becomes a harmful act. The soul cries out saying, she has deprived me of food. Which, which Sri Krishna says uh, is in the Gita, the extremes of doing this kind of thing, he says, outrages the Atma. These are his words in the Gita. And this is what Holy Mother is pointing to. The soul, the Atman, says, she's deprived me of food. I'm, 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 I'm reeling here. You know, I'm, I'm not comfortable. There's no reason to be uncomfortable. Okay, dear, oh, please read that. Okay. Yes, dear. Yeah, I was going to say that sometimes um, some people just take these things to the extreme without using common sense. Uh, perhaps, you know, the Ekadashi fast or those were suggested for health reasons. Like now intermittent fasting has become such a popular way to, I guess, maintain weight. Um, so, and also maybe to develop a certain degree of discipline. But when they carry it to the extreme um, and force somebody who doesn't want to or is not able to, that then becomes a rigidity, a tradition. And sometimes I think even the, the priests, the, they supposedly, you know, learn scriptures or whatever. But the reason I'm bringing this up is, um, you know, my sister passed away recently and her two boys who are in their 40s are they are kind of like they want to follow everything so the priest comes up with all these ridiculous suggestions that they should not eat anything until this time or they should not eat any this or that time or whatever and i mean they are following it but i just could not find any reason in some of the well, it's all that it's all scriptural somehow it's all in the it's probably not vedic but it's probably in the smriti somewhere you know, in the in the later scriptures, you know, these things. But this is why um, both uh, uh, Sri Chaitanya and Sri Ramakrishna uh, and, and other great teachers, they're very wary of this priestcraft business. Um, and uh, so, as it says, Holy Mother, Yogin Ma and Golap Ma did not fast completely on the Ekadashi day. They ate luchis, which is bread, fruit, and sweets. In other words, they kept their blood sugar up. They ate some carbohydrates, so they kept their blood sugar up. They didn't indulge in luxuriant food, but they didn't fast completely either. As you say, common sense. Priests are not known for their common sense. Priests are known for thing, doing things that advantage them. 
It's an unfortunate truth, but it's true. Anything else from anyone? Okay, well, thanks for bringing that up, Swayam. And it's always get, good to get these personal uh, aspects where people are actually living this right this this day. And of course, it's always a fine line to walk. Mm -hmm. Am I being self-centered or am I being commonsensical? Mm. But this is why Yogatmananda told that story to his congregation. You know, if you're sitting for meditation, and uh, just another story uh, came to mind. Uh, Swami Asesananda. Um, Swami Asesananda used to have a group of disciples that would come early in the morning, 6 a.m., and, and meditate with him. But the first thing they did was have their choice, a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and a banana. And of course, the, the Swami would uh, offer the bananas and then they became prasad and he would take the first one. So then it also became his prasad. And so, you know, this was very auspicious for the devotees. But this is what he would do. This is what the mother just said a, a few lines back. Mm -hmm. So this is what Swami Asesananda did with his devotees that joined him for meditation. They all had a cup of coffee or tea and a banana before they went in and sat. Oh, but you won't be able to concentrate. All the blood will go to your stomach. Well, temporarily, yes. But if you're going to be together in the shrine as they were for an hour, then, you know, and part of that was the Swami talking. Part of it was uh, deep meditation because he would take them into deep meditation. But they would, you know, they, that was, they would, they would, they would be in the shrine from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Or slightly, slightly after 6 a.m. because they'd have their banana and their coffee and tea before they went into the shrine. So common sense, common sense. Um, just another personal recent story. My niece lost her father-in-law and they actually went to India to do the last rites. And you know, in India, they do something or the other every day for 13 days. Yes. So my niece was telling me they had to take bath like five or six times a day during these pujas and and sometimes they have to stay with the wet clothes so it, it just again um, doesn't uh, reason cannot understand that well you know this uh, Sri Ramakrishna used to say to his disciples and most particularly to Hazra don't have a mania for purity and this, this kind of behavior is what would be classified by the master as a mania for purity. This bathing five or six times a day. I mean, how can we say anything about it other than to quote the master? I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about those rites, but I know that people do it. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, people from here uh, have gone to India, or even if they didn't go to India, they they uh, did the, that 13 day. Um, and it's supposed to be not for the benefit of the individual, but for the benefit of the soul of the departed. Well, the master was very clear, Sri Ramakrishna was very clear. Um, the soul of the departed uh, will be most helped by your loving and compassionate thoughts, not by this mania for purity. I'm glad we had this discussion. Anything else from anyone? You know, Swayam used the term common sense. 
What does common sense mean? It looks, it, it means you look and say, where is the middle way here? Sri Krishna says to take the middle way. The master implies this without saying it in so many words. Buddha was very clear about it. It's one of his eightfold path. So, anything else from anyone? Remember, remember, dears, you do not have anything to prove to anyone because other people might expect you to do things, you do not have to meet their expectations. If you choose to do it for the sake of harmony or because you are more concerned about the other person being upset than about your particular activities in, a, in the particular moment, all that's loving and good. But just remember, you have nothing to prove to anyone. You are a, your true original nature is perfect. And you are a child of the divine, perfect and pure. Of course, that, it, that perfect and pure being is immersed in ignorance and is finding its way as best it can. So, the middle way, the middle path. Anything else from anyone? Okay, please read on, dear. Holy Mother had a very soft corner in her heart for the poor and downtrodden people of society. Shirod Bala Roy recalled, one day a woman vendor came to Udbodan to sell blankets. She wanted one rupee for Anas for one blanket. Nalini began to bargain with her and offered one rupee. After a while, the mother said to Nalini, why are you haggling so long for poor Anas? Shame on you. <laughs> this poor woman carries her merchandise on her head and moves from door to door to earn a little money and you are detaining her such a long time. Moreover, you don't need a blanket. Still, <laughs> still you want to buy one. It would be better to buy one blanket for her, Holy Mother, Holy Mother was pointing to, to Shirod Bala, as she sleeps only on a blanket and she has only one. She's content with only one blanket and never asks for anything from anyone. Shirod Bala was touched by the mother's compassion and also amazed by how the mother kept track of her needs. Love is the cement that connects human hearts. I'll read one more time. Love is the cement that connects human hearts. A loveless life is dull and dreary, boring and tiresome, heavy and burdensome, painful and unpleasant. Now let's just, let's just read that right again from the beginning yes. about love is the cement. Yes. Love is the cement that connects human hearts. A loveless life is dull and dreary, boring and tiresome, heavy and burdensome, painful and unpleasant. Now, this is Swami Chetanananda talking. This is not the mother talking. This is not one of mother's disciples talking. This is Swami Chetanananda talking directly to us. Love is the cement. And so, generate the cement, let it set. And what is cement? Cement is long lasting, durable. I mean, he did not, he did not uh, choose that word uh, idly. So to avoid this kind of life, 
dull and boring, tiresome, heavy and burdensome, painful and unpleasant. So now what did Tennyson say? Tennyson said, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. That's one of his more famous lines. Very much. Okay. Holy, Holy Mother taught a naughty little girl who had given her family a great deal of trouble how to love. Mukulmala, a granddaughter of Bhavanath Chattopadhyay, regularly came to Udbodhan house with her parents and the mother always gave her plenty of sweets to eat. Hmm. The mother initiated her when she was nine years old. Once when Holy Mother was about to leave for Jairambati, she said to the girl, darling, you have been visiting me a long time. Do you love me? Yes, I love you very much. How much? The girl stretched her arms as wide as she could and said, that much. Holy Mother asked, will you still love me when I am away at Jairambati? Yes, I will love you just the same. I shall not forget you. How shall I know it? What should I do to make you know? I shall be sure of your love for me if you can love everyone at your home. Ah, Beautiful. See how mother is teaching her. As this is priceless. Any comments or questions from anyone? Beautiful. Can I um, share another personal example where I recently felt that love connection? Mm -hmm. So um, when I, we were driving back, we stayed overnight with this friend of mine. We were uh, in school together from first grade through high school, and then we went different paths in terms of careers. And uh, I, you know, you learn more about somebody um, every time you meet and interact. And we were, we've been good friends through the years and we were sort of, um, you know, uh, competing for uh, the best grades in school and all that. And of course, now she's a very successful um, in her field of entrepreneurship. And um, so when we stopped by, we were talking a lot about, again, um, her and she studied uh, as a part of her PhD a lot of cognitive science, neuroscience, philosophy. In addition, oh to, my. Uh, she worked in a Nobel laureate in Carnegie Mellon by name Herb Simon, and uh, in addition to that, her you know computer science and whatever. So she's got, but now she is into consciousness studies um, just for interest, and because of that, she's taken up quantum mechanics too, so that she can understand that. And we were just talking in general about all this um, spirituality and meditation. And and um, she um, told me that she has had some mystical experiences as well as on a couple of occasions, uh, this feeling of, uh, I guess, nothing matters. Like, you know, um, I guess the best way is at, at totally at peace. And I mean, she's gone through some really tough times. So, but very warm and... Um, She's going to be honored in Sweden in a ceremony almost uh, akin to the Nobel Prize. And she got a huge sum of money. But the warmth that she exuded um, and the willingness with which she was um, able to share with me, uh, you know, her experiences and whatever questions I asked, um, at the end of the night and then the next morning when I left, uh, until then we were friends, I admired her. But there was a moment when I totally, you know, felt the love and likewise when we embraced, it was, it was something I cannot describe. All I had was love. Everything else was secondary. Beautiful. Beautiful. Where does this woman live? She teaches in the University of uh, Virginia in the Darden Business School. Do she you suppose there. that she would be willing to give us a talk? on her uh, studies in consciousness and her and her personal involvement with this uh, over Zoom? Do you suppose you could contact her about that? 
I will definitely ask her. She, Please I think, do. Rec- yeah, she recently uh, was a participant and a keynote speaker in some conference uh, in a Japanese uh, monastery uh, where she gave, I guess, I don't know exactly what she talked about, but something, some connection between um, the, um, uh, I guess, entrepreneurship and um I don't know if it was consciousness, but meditation or something. So yeah, definitely I will request her. Just um, just what we would like her to talk about is her personal journey, okay. particularly in in recent years. Okay. And uh, tell her this is this is just a tiny but very uh, very dedicated and very sincere congregation. Yeah. And they will listen attentively to her. Yes. And and be sure and tell her that our way of being together is to uh, allow conversation, uh, not just at the end of of a presentation, but uh, in in the as it goes along, yes. so that uh, people are able to air their own reactions, mm-hmm. uh, which are coming from this deep well of wisdom and uh, their concerns and questions so that they don't have to stumble on trying to understand what someone is saying without uh, being able to ask the question that will resolve what is causing them to mentally stumble. Yes, definitely. What is is her name? Uh, Her name is um, Saras Saraswati. Her original name was Saraswati and then the last name. But after she... um, I guess uh, got divorced from her first husband. She just changed her first name to Saras and kept her original first name as her last name. Um, so, S A R A S Saras. Uh huh. Saras. Saras Saraswati. Uh, with a V. S A R A S V A T H Y. Um, so, if you Google the name, I mean, there's lots of um, stuff about her work. And another thing she said was. Uh, as she was working on her PhD, she's a big fan of William James. Aha! Uh-huh. And she reads everything that he's written, and she felt like um, somehow she uh, something that William James wanted to publish towards the end, and it didn't get done. And then, she, as she was reading, it clicked to her what he wanted to say, and she used that in her final thesis and at that moment she felt like she and mind of William James connected. Ah. It was amazing to hear what she was saying. I'm so glad you brought this up, dear, and tell her we earnestly would like to hear her speak. Uh, uh, and uh, at, 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 at her convenience, yes. but since she's in the same time zone, right. uh, it would be at 11 a.m. on a Sunday. Okay. But she can just choose the Sunday, any okay. any Sunday but May fifteenth, <laughs> okay. because that's our annual meeting of the congregation. Okay. But uh, she is definitely. Uh, we would very much love to hear from her. I will ask her. Saras Saraswati. Yeah, I can email you. Um, please, please do, dear. Yeah, and you said a particular day. What was the annual uh, meeting of the congregation? Oh. Well, it's this May fifteenth, just oh, just okay. a, just a, a, a short time from now. That's the only time that I would say we, we would say no. You know, there are there are other times toward the end of the year mm-hmm. when we'll be having a puja, mm-hmm. but there's lots of time. There's all, all, all the rest of the spring and summer and into the fall before we begin our puja season again. So, yeah, I will definitely send in a request. Um, I know that she said that she would be rather busy um, because the award is on the 25th, but it's like a week long thing. And she. Uh, oh, well, she's, like I say, there's months out ahead that she's able to schedule us. And yeah. uh, so. You uh, mean next May? No, 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 oh. no, no, dear. Oh, okay. No, there's, I mean, the annual meeting of the congregation is in just a few days, May 15th. Huh. Right. Just the day before Swami Sarvadevananda comes. Right. That's our annual meeting of the congregation. Yeah. So there's all that time 
between now and the beginning of the puja season, oh. which is in the fall. Okay. Our first puja will be Durga puja, which will probably be in October. Okay. So there's all those months. Okay. And I know she's terribly busy. Of course, people like that are. Okay. They're just they're just very busy. Okay. But uh, uh, yeah. you know the the fact that her name is Saraswati is so <laughs> just that by itself tells you volumes. Yeah. Yeah. Please do look her up and. Uh, oh, I will. Just please send me the name and yeah, I will. Yeah, I will. And I will um, yeah, I will talk to her and see any time between May and October if she's free. Yeah, any time between uh, the uh, the uh, let's see the fifteenth. Any time between the twenty second of May mm -hmm. and and just tell her Durga Puja. She can okay. she can look it up. Sure, thank you, and um, I hope I didn't take congregation's time. Well, you. dear, I can only speak for myself, but I'm sure that I'm sure other people are, are just as delighted. Back that you have a such a friend and that uh, she might be willing to to take time to speak with us because uh this is this is one of those people who is a brilliant light in the world she wouldn't be receiving this prize um i think i know the name of the prize but i can't bring it to mind just now uh it's it has to do with uh, well anyway uh, I'll, I'll look it up after I see. It's called Global Award in Entrepreneurship Research. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that one at all. And she's the first Indian woman to win in the last 20 years. My goodness. All right. Let's read on a little bit, unless there's something else from anyone. All right, we have eight minutes left. Let's yeah, read on. Sure. I shall be sure of your love for me if you can love everyone at your home. All right. I will love all of them. I will not be naughty anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's very good. But how shall I know that you will love everyone equally and not some more or some less? What should I do to love everyone equally? Let me tell you how to love everyone equally. Do not demand anything of those you love. If you make demands, some will give you more and some less. In that case, you will love more those who give you more and less those who give you less. Thus, your love will not be the same for all. You will not be able to love everyone impartially. A little girl, little girl promised to love everyone without demanding anything in return. Her family reported that from, that from that time forward, her behavior was exemplary. Do you want me to read that paragraph one more time, Brother Shankar? I want you to read it over from the beginning. Okay, this sure. This whole business about the little girl. Okay, sure. Let me go back to that. Okay. Mukulmala, a granddaughter of Bhavanath Chattopadhyay, regularly came to Udbodhan house with her parents and the mother always gave her plenty of sweets to eat. The mother initiated her when she was nine years old. Once when Holy Mother was about to leave for Jairambati, she said to the girl, darling, you have been visiting me a long time. Do you love me? Yes, I love you very much. How much? The girl stretched her arms as wide as she could and said that much. <laughs> Holy Mother asked, will you still love me when I'm away at Jairambati? Yes, I will love you just the same. I shall not forget you. How shall I know it? What should I do to make you know? I shall be sure of your love for me if you can love everyone at your home. All right, I will love all of them. I will not be naughty anymore. Mm -mm -mm. That's very good. But how shall I know 
that you will love everyone equally and not some more or some less. What should I do to love everyone equally? Let me tell you how to love everyone equally. Do not demand anything of those you love. If you make demands, some will give you more and some less. In that case, you will love more those who give you more and less those who give you less. Thus, your love will not be the same for all. You will not be able to love everyone impartially. The little girl promised to love everyone without demanding anything in return. Her family reported that from that time forward, her behavior was exemplary. What, Unconditional love. <laughs> what a story. Yes, beautiful. Good lesson for all of us. Yes. So what comes next, dear? Next is the chapter, Two Flowers. It's a 32 chapter on two flowers on one stem. Ah, yes, this is the story of the master and the hibiscus plant. Yes, they have a picture too, Brother Shankara. Half of master and half of mother on the next page. It's beautifully done, whoever the painter was, painter Bijali. Uh, there's a long footnote here. Yeah. It starts referring to her troublesome relatives. Do you see that footnote? I don't have in my book here. It says refer, let me read it. Yes, please. Referring to her troublesome relatives. Huh. Oh, I see. <laughs> this is that. That's this is a series of footnotes. Never mind. This is, uh, yeah, it's just a series of footnotes. Um, I thought it was one long footnote until I put on my glasses. <laughs> so um, I, I think we'll we call it quits for this evening. Yeah, and, and start next week with two flowers. Flowers. Chapter 32, which uh, is a, an interesting number, 32 adds to 5, which is a number of change. Mm. So we'll um, finish for the night. Oh, beloved master, a flower at your feet for each one who comes to your open door. A flower at your feet for each one who stands by your open door and says, come to me, come to me, offering to break this world's chain that binds us down to ignorance, suffering, and death. A flower at your feet for each one who takes the path that you have struck through this, your jungle world, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Amen. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Jai Sri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. May we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So any final thought from anyone? Anyone at all? All right, dears. Tomorrow evening, we will continue to read and discuss Swami Vivekananda's talk the real and the apparent man from jnana yoga and then of course on saturday uh, we'll talk about uh, 
How to Know God, Swami Prabhupada's translation of and interpretation of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And, oh my goodness, once again, I can't seem to remember what the, what the topic is for this. Oh, I do too. It's, uh, 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 the reason is it's not me talking. We have a guest speaker this coming Sunday. Uh, his name is Gareth Young. He's a friend of mine. Practically, we became friends practically as soon as I came here 12 years ago, nearly 12 years ago. And he's been a friend ever since. Um, he is just last September. He was ordained, or as they say in their tradition, transmitted. He received his transmission as a Buddhist teacher. And Gareth will speak in the chapel on uh, this coming Sunday morning. His topic will be, uh, remember, it's a month for the study of Jnana Yoga. His topic will be not knowing, not knowing. Gareth Young, ordained Buddhist teacher, this coming Sunday at 11 from the chapel, not knowing. And then, as I said, on May 15th, please mark your calendar for that. If you can be here in person, it would be a, a great uh, privilege to have you here. Uh, we will uh, put out a call for who is going to come in person, because after the annual meeting, when we meet in person like this, there is a lunch provided by your board of trustees. Um, and uh, it's always a very nice lunch and it's always good to get together afterwards and talk about whatever it is we want to talk about. Of course, always there's, there's stuff to be talked about, about what was discussed in the annual meeting of the congregation during which you hear reports from the officers of your corporation and uh, a, a few words from me. And uh, then of course the, uh, the, the board for the coming year will be elected by the congregation. So that's what's going to happen on the 15th of May. Talk with you again soon. Jai Sri Ramakrishna Jai Ma. Good night. Good night. Thank you.